There you go. That was the result over at Fenway Park today. 7-1, I think, was the final score. Is that right, Jimmy Stewart? 7-1? That is correct, Tony. I'm really bad at final scores. I should mention that. That for whatever reason, it's like one of the most insignificant things to me ever is what the final score was. You either won or you lost in this particular. I mean, it matters. I'm not telling you it doesn't matter. I'm telling you I'm bad at it. Always, for some reason, I'd get it in my head. I stop watching them. It's like five to one, and I think when it's seven to one or five to one, what's the freaking difference? You lost the game anyway. Six one seven 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 nine zero ninety eight five. I say more that. about how they lost, Tony. Well, exactly. So we'll open up the phone lines right away because it is only a half hour tonight on the baseball hour, which seems like a bit of an oxymoron in this particular case. But again, we'll open up the phone lines right away because as far as openers go. Hard to think of it going much more poorly than it did for the Red Sox over at Fenway Park. Talk about things that went wrong today. Nick Pavetta placed on the disabled list with a a sore elbow. Interestingly enough, the Red Sox announced that after their clubhouse was closed so nobody could speak with any of the principals involved, specifically Pavetta. I just think that's an interesting little detail. Either Pavetta didn't want to talk or they didn't want him to talk or they wanted to hide it under the flurry of opening day or whatever. I don't know. But Nick Pavetta, unavailable. I don't know if anybody spoke with him after the game. Just mentioning it. It came out before the game. Trevor Story, season-ending surgery, scheduled for Friday. He's done for the year. Not shocking. We knew they were going to examine him at the beginning of the week, but nonetheless, extremely noteworthy. Then the Red Sox went out, played the Orioles, the first, I shouldn't say legit opponent, because Seattle's pretty good. But the best opponent they've played this year, and they get their asses kicked. 7-1, out hit 13-2, as you just heard. The Red Sox made two errors, could have been more. I thought Devers got a gift of an error, or there was a base hit called on a play that could have been an error that was a gift to Raphael Devers, who uh, blew a play in Anaheim over the weekend to cost the Red Sox a game there. So bad defense, out hit, outscored, obviously. And I should mention, the starting pitcher for the Baltimore Orioles today, Jimmy Stewart, was who? Do you know? I do know. Who was it? Corbin Burns, an ace pitcher who the Red Sox could have had but didn't want to trade the prospects or give potentially an extension to, which is going to be coming now that the Orioles have new ownership. Okay, acquired by the Orioles in an offseason deal, Corbin Burns, who uh, is exactly what Baltimore needs, a legit front-end kind of guy that can allow them to compete against teams in the postseason, which is something they lacked last year. So basically, one team that built through its farm system, now trading for pitching, doing everything you want the Red Sox to do, except the Red Sox do have the additional problem of being unable to catch the ball. There was one error in particular today, and they all matter, don't get me wrong. The one that really blew the game open, and I say or tilted the game, was uh, a misplay by Jaron Duran in left field that led to a rally for Baltimore. The Orioles then got a big hit with two outs to take a 3-1 to one lead, and that was it. The Red Sox weren't going to score. The only run they got was on a solo homer by, you guessed it, Tyler O'Neill in the first inning, six home runs, six RBI on the season for Tyler O'Neill. Solo homer, Mr. Solo. Uh, the Duran error was as bad as it gets for an outfielder, if you ask me. Jimmy, can we play that, please? The Duran. Sorry, the Duran error. Shot into left field. Duran moving back, and he will not make the play in fair territory. Runner will hold at third. And Duran simply did not make the play. That ball should have been caught. Instead, second and third and two down and life for Baltimore. I don't know if he lost this one Mm -hmm. in the sun or or something because I was just going to talk about how the foot speed in left field is different this year. Durant's covering more ground and he gets to the spot and just sort of whiffs at it and just misses it. Yeah, there is sun out there, and especially this kind of a timed game at 2.05, it ended up starting about 2.30 uh, with everything going on, but you can tell that sun is just behind, and if you take your eyes off a click, and who knows, he could have been right in there for a second, because usually in the sun, you'll, you'll it'll go in there for 1, 1,002, and then it comes out, but you have to stay with it, but you can tell, we saw it with his Oakleys, the sun immediately in live, but then looking back there, who knows. Okay, so again, what I don't want to hear about is the sun on a play like this, with all due respect. Lou Merloni had it right. He just flat out missed it. He flat out missed it. 
He ran into the left field corner. He, it was a routine play. It sounds like off the bat, like, you know, when you hear the beginning of the call, that he had to run a long way for it, and it was this athletic catch, although Dave O'Brien, you know, certainly said, well, he was right there. He got to catch that. So I will tell you the same thing. That play's got to be made. I would equate this, it, it not com- not terribly unlike the play Raffaella whiffed on in Anaheim. His was more routine. He didn't have to move very far for it, from it. But either way, Duran was there in plenty of time. He was standing up straight. His arm wasn't extended. He just missed it. Sloppy play. So now we've seen this in two games from the Red Sox. In Anaheim, which was the night Trevor Story got hurt, they went into a lapse defensively in that game. Then it happened again today on a day where Nick Pivetta gets hurt, Trevor Story's news comes down, and my guess is the players knew about Story before today. Maybe they didn't know about Pavetta. We'll get to more on that shortly. But the point is the Red Sox played crappy defense. They got two hits. Bayo was okay. I thought Bayo threw some really good pitches today. I would say this is the best I've seen him. Now, again, I will also tell you we were in studio, so it's not like I, I was you know pouring over every pitch. But when I looked up there, it looked to me like he was hitting corners more frequently than he did earlier in the season in his other two outings. So, lots of bad stuff over there at Fenway Park. We'll get to your phones right away. I would love to add just one question to the conversation because I put this on Twitter today. The 2004 team was honored. Tim Wakefield was remembered over at Fenway Park. There was some good stuff there pregame over at Fenway. You all know how I feel about Wakefield I'm glad Kurt Schilling wasn't there from uh, to be a distraction, but I will also say, how do you celebrate the 0-4 team without Kurt Schilling? He was kind of a big part of it. So, and I'm not blaming the I'm not blaming anyone for this. I'm just saying the fact that it came to this is really kind of sad. We all know who to blame for it. I'm just telling you that. How do you celebrate the Red Sox in 2004 without Kurt Schilling? As a total aside, now. The 4 team, this is my question for you, and you don't have to answer it tonight because we're up against it, but I'm throwing it out there anyway. You have to be 35 or over to answer this question. If you're under 35, you can call in, but with all due respect, you're not allowed to vote because you didn't see the 4 team play. I don't think if you're under the age of 35, you have to have been at least 15 years old to have some understanding of what that team faced. Jimmy Stewart. The 04 team and the 2018 team, which one are you taking? 2004 team, no okay. question. Okay, good, same. 75% of the people that responded on my Twitter poll, I think, had the 2004 team. But again, those are people over the age of 35. I just find that in this particular argument, most people who picked 2018 didn't see the 24, you know, the 04 season because they weren't old enough or they weren't born yet. So anyway, 617-779-0985. Uh, Martin in Texas. Good, Martin. Hi, Tony. Um, I know you talked about yesterday how you haven't seen Rafael play in the infield or anything like that, but if you watch the game today, and I know you can watch the whole game, I'd much rather watch Jaron Duran try to field the fly ball than watch David Hamilton try to field the grounder to the middle infield because he can't do it, and they need to just make the switch today now that they know the story's out for the season. They just got to get it over with. Okay, so Martin, I don't know what's going to happen there at shortstop. We'll see. The, the Red Sox certainly gave indication today. Craig Breslow gave indication that they're going to try to fill it internally. I don't know how that's going to work. Maybe it is going to be Rafaela coming in from center field. I'm just telling you, I, again, I don't know how good Rafaela is at shortstop. I should, but I don't. I'd have to go back and watch stuff from last year. I didn't pay a ton of attention when they were out of it late in the year. And honestly, I'm not sure it's the best time to make an evaluation anyway. But I don't like the idea of taking him out of center because I think he's dynamic in center field. Uh, Scott in Lunenburg. Ed, Scott. How you doing, guys? I would take the old four team just for the hell of it, tell you that. Um, okay, my thing is this this organization is such a fraud. With, with this ceremony today with uh, Tim Wakefield, did you notice how the management – was on the field. They didn't announce or anything, so they couldn't get booed with, without the ceremony going on. It's just a fraud. This whole thing is just disgust me. What's going on there? Yeah, so look, again, you have, your, you have a right to be angry. Felt to me like the ballpark wasn't a sellout today. I don't know if officially it was or it wasn't. Jimmy, I don't know if you've seen anything official with regard to that. 36000 and change. They had the bleachers blocked off or you know covered up. 
uh, for the for the um, batter's eye, the backdrop. So that might have been the capacity in the ballpark, but I can tell you this, there wasn't demand, there wasn't interest. Those types of things just didn't really exist for this game. The ceremonies, sure. And I would tell you, I was thrilled to see that Tim Wake, I think it was Tim Wakefield's daughter that threw out the first pitch. Yeah, it was. Okay, again, because we were in studio, I presumed it was Wakefield's son and daughter, uh, which I thought was a fabulous way to uh, do opening day. Those kids have had it tougher than anybody. Lost their father and their mother within a matter of three or four months. So, um, you know, there were a lot of things I'd like to see happen over at Fenway Park, given what Wakefield gave to the organization, uh, given that what he and his wife gave to the organization. I think there's a way to preserve his memory and his community interests. My guess is that the Red Sox are way ahead of me on this. I'm not criticizing them for it. But the uh, Brianna is Tim's daughter. Uh, the son's name is Trevor. I think Trevor's actually older. And, you know, they, they've they been dealt some serious challenges here at an age where uh, two kids shouldn't have to deal with it. And I think they are basically 19 and 17, if I'm right, somewhere in that area, 20 and 18, uh, pretty close to the age of my kids. I've mentioned this before, but the only reason I know that is because Wakefield and I got married at the same time, had kids at the same time, all, all that kind of stuff. We used to talk about the sort of thing frequently. And so, um, you know, I feel uh, deeply for his for his children and his remaining family, you know, his parents, all of them. So in any case, uh, I want to get to Craig Brezzo, some things he said. Again, we have a really tight, quick show tonight. We're done at 630 because of uh, Bruins pregame right here on 985, the sports hub followed by the Bruins and Carolina Hurricanes. We'll get to Nick Pavetta's injury and Craig Breslow's comments when we come back.
So this to me is a big issue. This is a big issue with the Red Sox. It's a big issue in baseball, and it's becoming a bigger issue because the players' union is making noise about it. And here's how it relates to the Red Sox today. Nick Pavetta, who has been nothing if not durable during his time with the Red Sox, is now hurt. Okay, Nick Pavetta has a flexor strain in his right elbow. Now, that's basically a sore elbow. And that flexor strain is often a precursor to a Tommy John surgery. Now, before you go, oh, let me just say, based on everything Breslow said today, it's a minor strain. They're taking a, a, a spot in the schedule here, a preemptive move, not even preemptive, but early move, to prevent this thing and make it go away. The, the way Breslow was talking, they think this thing could be over in two weeks and Pavetta will be back on the mound. But here's why I think it's important. The Red Sox are throwing more breaking stuff this year, and all of a sudden Nick Pavetta's fastball usage drops through the floor, and now he's hurt. Is that a coincidence? I don't think it is. In fact, I think, the, and the Boston Globe did a story on this recently, and there are all kinds of stories throughout Major League Baseball on it, but it's important to you know re- delve into the details. Nick Pavetta last year threw his fastball 50% of the time. 50, 5 zero. You heard Sean McAdams say there that some of these arm injuries are being linked to the um, increased use of the sweeper, which is basically a horizontal slider, Okay. Uh, or in some cases, actually has some depth to it, too. But the sweeper, it's its basically a slider. If you look online, you'll find that there are a lot of theories out there that sliders cause more arm injuries than any other pitch. Okay, now again, you can believe them, you cannot believe them. I'm just telling you what's out there. It makes sense. It's a pitch thrown with velocity and break. Curveballs put less strain on the arm because they're more about the spin. Fastballs put less strain on the arm because they're more about the velocity than the spin. And you don't have to torque your elbow really to get the spin per se, uh, you know, unless you're throwing cutters, in which case it's not a fastball. But a slider is kind of an in-betweener. And so you're going to put more torque and strain on your arm by throwing sliders. Nick Pavetta last year threw that sweeper 5% of the time. This year, it's about 25%. So now you tell me, Is Nick Pavetta hurt because they've altered what they want him to throw? Or is Nick Pavetta hurt because of the pitch clock, which is the garbage that Major League Baseball Players Association, the union, is trying to feed people? Because I think that the pitch clock thing is garbage. I think it's complete, total garbage. And I think the union thinks it's garbage, but they know that nobody knows, so they're just trying to muddy the waters. That's my opinion. During spring training... Pitchers in the Red Sox clubhouse were asked about the rash of arm injuries. Chris Martin, the reliever, to his credit, said, and I quote, everybody is chasing elite stuff, different grips, different types of mechanics, trying different things over and over can maybe cause stress on different parts of your body that you're not used to using. Couldn't agree with him more. Breslow himself said something similar in the comment we just played. Couldn't agree with him more. I thought those were honest answers. You know what Nick Pavetta said? Uh, Nick Pavetta says the biggest thing that's changed is the pitch clock. They shorten the time again on us without really communicating to us at all. All the union votes were against it. MLB went ahead and shortened it anyways because they think it's better for the game. But I thought the game was plenty quick enough last year. I would assume that is probably the biggest cause of injuries. Now, he says the game was plenty quick last year. You know who bitched about the pitch clock last year? Nick Pavetta. He made it through the year without any injuries. Now, all of a sudden, he's throwing the sweeper more and he gets hurt, but he still wants to blame the pitch clock, which they did increase by another second or two. So, to me, Nick Pavetta's got himself in a pickle here. Either he's got to throw his team under the bus or because he's throwing more uh, sweepers, or he's got to turn his back, you know, and if he does that, he's turning his back on the union. Nick Pavetta, what's he going to say now? I'd love to hear it. I don't know if he spoke after the game. I'd love to know what he thinks now. Now that he's hurt, is he still going to blame the pitch clock? Because the data suggests that it's something else. 
Anyway, we'll zip through a couple of calls here, but again, we're done in a few minutes, so I ask you both to be, I ask you all, not both, because there were seven of you on the line. Um, but there, I got a couple of Raphael Devers calls coming up, so both of the Devers people, make your point quickly, because I think you have the same one. Larry and Dedham, go ahead. They're going to move Devers off third base. He's going to be a disaster. They have to wear uh, solar eclipse sunglasses during day games, and I agree that Chris Schilling should have been there at uh, because of his, he worked for, did a lot for ALS. Uh, okay, it's Kurt Schilling. Uh, you can't wear those uh, glasses during the game because you can't see the ball. And Devers, I mean, uh, uh, what's his name? Duran's going to make that catch either way. Tim and Lowell on Devers. Go ahead. Tony, his defense is killing us at third base. He was charged with 19 errors last year. He should have been charged with 25. He's soft and out of shape. He's worse defensively now than he was when he came up. And honestly, Tony, he's the worst defensive third baseman I've ever seen in a Red Sox uniform. Okay, I don't know if I'd go that far. Butch Hobson was pretty bad back in the late 70s, but that's neither here nor there. You don't have to delve into that if you don't want. And I will tell you, Devers' weight has nothing to do with either one of the errors he's made. Either one. Both balls are basically hit within a step or two of them to his left. He didn't have to move much. He just whiffed on him. Now, again, here's the other thing. You're going to make him the DH? Okay, who's going to play third? And uh, how many DHs do you want? The whole reason you gave Devers $31 million is so he can play third. And you've got bigger problems than Raphael Devers at third base right now. You're right about his defense. They have bigger problems. John in Freetown on the uh, Sedan Raphael extension. Go ahead. Matt, uh, do you, what is your opinion on this? Because I don't understand locking up a kid who's played 35 games in the major leagues, who, who plays a, pre, a very good defensive outfield and is probably going to bat somewhere between 220 and 230. Like, I just John, don't understand John, the principle. Yeah, I'm going to let you go just because we're up against it. I'm trying to move fast. I don't get it either. He doesn't feel like the kind of guy to me that you have to sign 40 games into his career. Do they like him? Sure. Does he have some attributes? Yes. Is he going to hit? I don't know. So, Brian Bayo, I can look at and say he's a big league pitcher. At worst, I think he's a middle-of-the-rotation guy. But let's say he's a number four starter and you want to pay him $8 million a year. No problem. If Sedan Raphael is a utility guy, you want to commit $50 million to him over eight years? Because I don't. So, I feel like they're taking this whole, you know, sign young guys thing too far because they want to show you that they are spending money. I, I really do. I feel like it's sort of gone over the edge. <laughs> home for sports in the sports hub a Beasley media group station this is the duncan bruins pregame show america runs on duncan boston bruins hockey driven by the versatile honda crv available at your local new england honda dealers also brought to you by va new england granite city electric gce nitrate valvoline instant oil change tito's handmade vodka live nation nissan avidia bank the fuel rewards program from shell peerless boilers coors banquet the peterson school clinton savings bank and by shaw's and star market two seconds one second it's over the bruins have won the stanley cup and by catches law td bank Ticketmaster. Town Fair Tire, your New England Ford dealers, Charles D. Sheehy, UMass Lowell, Timberline Construction, Service Credit Union, Bosch Tools, and by DraftKings Sportsbook. After 39 long years, the Cup is back home. The Bruins are 2011 Stanley Cup champions. Now, here's John Surratt and Bob Beers. Tonight, the Boston Bruins have a chance to win the Atlantic Division title and, in the process, capture their fifth consecutive victory. They're going to square off against the Carolina Hurricanes, a team that actually has more regulation wins than the Bruins do, and a group that the Bees stung 4-1 to in Raleigh last Thursday. Along with Bob Beers, I'm Judd Surratt. We welcome you inside TD Garden, and we welcome you once again to the Duncan Bruins pregame show. Our storylines are sponsored by Coors Banquet. Bruins fans raise a banquet to 100 years of Bruins hockey. Coors Banquet is proud to celebrate the lasting legacy of Bruins hockey during their centennial season. Coors Banquet, official partner of the Boston Bruins. Lately, the Bruins have dialed in the details of their game, and head coach Jim Montgomery said that includes the way they're finishing. Everybody's really comfortable with who we are, how we need to execute, 
the effort it required and the physicality that's required. I think that's where our group now has confidence in how to close out games, how to take games, and how to push games out of reach. Yeah, it, it, it's important to kind of clarify what physicality means in, in Jim Montgomery and the coaching staff's mind. It, it's it's winning battles. It's doing the little things, you know, in a physical way to make sure that you, whether it's taking a hit to make a play, whether it's getting in somebody's way, separating somebody from a puck, it's not necessarily running guys through the boards and it's not necessarily dropping the gloves. Physicality comes in a lot of different uh, areas. You know, it's blocking shots. It's, it's you know, it's all those things, the little things that it takes and that mentality to win games when the games are really on the line and the games really count. I, I think it's benefited the Bruins to play some teams that are good teams you know 